welcome everyone to our session. It's good to see you all. This is like a very good room. Hi uh, everyone. Yes, this is good. So, okay, today we will be uh, talking a little bit about Knative and Spring, Spring Cloud Functions, Knative Eventing, Knative Functions, and a bunch of other different things. We will be also playing a game uh, that we were like trying to troubleshoot like 10 minutes ago. It wasn't working. But we will see how it goes. Uh, yes. It should work. We will it's see. It's going to be fun. We will see that, yes. So um, our presentation is, is titled Bring Back the Funk. And you can imagine that's related to some functions and also some funk music as well. Yes. Uh, my name is Mauricio Salatino. I work for VMware. Um, I am uh, full time working on this project that's called Knative. It's something that you know will help you if you are targeting and using Kubernetes. I am a strong believer that you should have Knative installed if you're using you know, Kubernetes because it will save you a lot of time. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Salavoy there. And I'm also writing a book that it's called Continuous Delivery for Kubernetes, where I'm just covering kind of like a bunch of topics around how you can be a little bit more efficient when you are delivering software into Kubernetes and what kind of like tools you should be looking into. Uh, I'm really passionate about like Knative in general and functions. And this presentation is pretty close to my heart because we are using a lot of stuff that I've been building uh, uh, over the last few years. And I'm here with Thomas. Yes, I'm Thomas. Uh, I'm a software architect at Systematic, a Danish software company. I'm also really passionate about open source. I really believe that Knative should always be installed in any Kubernetes cluster. Uh, big fan of Cloud Native technologies and Spring Boot. So I'm also writing uh, a book. It's called Cloud Native Spring in Action. It will be published uh, this summer, but it's available in uh, early access at the moment. Also, like contributing to open source projects, for example, Spring Security and Spring Cloud, whenever I have time. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I really believe in uh, open source. Yes. Let's take it away, right? OK, so as I mentioned in the beginning, we will be playing a game all together. And we built this game for you folks. Uh, we will see how it goes. But I wanted to show you kind of like how the game looks like. So when at the end of the session, when we all play together, you kind of know what to expect and how to play. So let me jump in here. Let me check that I'm in the right environment. So this is kind of like how the game is. It's just a simple uh, game, like a quiz game, that you should be able to just jump in your phone and play, play with your phone. So there are multiple, uh, you know, multiple questions, like multiple answers uh, questions. Uh, and basically, before starting, kind of like each of these questions, each level, you need to just click there. The thing that you need to be aware is there is a timer there that it's basically giving you the amount of time that you have to answer the question. And then you just need to pick, pick one, select and then just move to the next level, right? If you save some time, you will get extra points because of that. And then there will be other questions where you need to do multiple things, like pressing buttons or, you know, or copying strings and doing that kind of stuff. And based on the title here, like on the, 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 the questionnaire, it's kind of like what you will be uh, doing. But very importantly, at the end of the game, there will be a button here that it should show at some point. It's not showing here probably because of security. Yeah, there is some security blocker there, but there is, a, there is going to be a Twitter button yeah, there. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to be showing, but the idea here is that we, all, we will all play. The ones that are ranked highest, they will get a prize. But in order to get a prize, you should be able to tweet kind of like uh, the, you know, the, the, the score that you get. So remember, it's going to be fast because you have 10 seconds per question. You need to do something to it fast so you get the, the most, you know, the most things here, right? And then you have the tweet there that's going to take you to Twitter. So you can just tweet the score. Uh, but before going into there, we will be talking about the technologies that we used in order to build this game and how that game was architected and all the issues that we found kind of like in the middle. Yes, let's start talking about serverless. So serverless doesn't mean that we don't have servers, but that is someone else's job to manage them. So uh, when I think about serverless, I think about developer experience. I, I'd really like for developers to be able to focus on code and not with all these uh, infrastructural and platform concerns. So while developers will focus on the business logic of uh, an application, then the platform should take care of everything else. So for example, should uh, take care of provisioning all the necessary infrastructure, should take care of manage uh, all the workloads that we want to deploy on the platform, and should also take care of dynamically scaling the applications depending on how many uh, clients and users uh, are uh, calling our applications. Uh, uh, and probably you guessed it, the way that we uh, define a serverless uh, platform on top of Kubernetes is using Knative. Knative is a great project. There are two main components. The first one is called Knative Serving, and it's exactly what we use to build a serverless experience on top of Kubernetes. First of all, we get some more 
uh, developer-friendly abstractions. So instead of dealing with uh, low-level deployments, spots, replica sets, uh, ingresses, we get one single abstraction that uh, we can use in order to uh, really make the developer experience better. We have this from code to URL experience. So we really, th that's our target. We want to get from our code to a URL of our service deployed in production without having to t take care of all the intermediate steps. Of course, uh, we want auto scaling in place. And uh, one of the main features of Knative is being able to deal with uh, scaling to zero. So that opens up a lot of possibilities because if there's no request to handle, no event to process, then we don't want uh, to pay, for example, cloud resources to keep our applications up and running. So it's both for cost optimization uh, and in order to use our resources in a better way. We have uh, on top of that a possibility to adopt uh, very advanced uh, deployment strategies, progressive rollouts. We can uh, deploy our applications using mm -hmm. blue-green deployments techniques. We can do canary releases, progressive delivery, all through the uh, same single abstraction. So without uh, dealing with uh, low-level concerns in the platform. Everything is request-driven or event-driven. That's how uh, the auto-scaling happens. It's based on requests and events. And finally, this is cloud agnostic. So since we have uh, this component deployed in Kubernetes, then we can use Knative everywhere on every Kubernetes distribution. So we can use it on any cloud, public cloud, or running locally, cloud agnostic. Let me ask a question. How many people here like know Knative? Like knew about the project before? Okay, how many are using it? Like not so many, we have a couple. That's how many that's using great. Kubernetes? <laughs> <laughs> you can save some time, folks. Come on, yes. let's do it. Yes. Yeah. So before getting there, uh, Knative, serving, uh, Knative Serving deals with containers. So we are building a kind of container as a service experience. Mm -hmm. So we need to provide a container image. Again, as a developer, I don't want to deal with, for example, writing a Docker file and maintain it. I want some automation there. A and probably from the operation point of view, the platform engineer, we want to make sure that developers don't make mistakes and use proper uh, containerization techniques in terms of uh, security, performance, and all of that. We can do that using cloud native build packs. This is a project, it's a specification to convert application source code into production ready container images. So we're gonna use together with Knative build packs in order to convert our code to a container image. And I guess we can uh, check a demo right now. So I have built a very simple Spring Boot application. You can see it here, just returning uh, a message. Welcome to Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So I have already containerized it. So let's check the Knative part first. I have uh, an image pushed on my uh, container registry on GitHub. So what I can do is using the Knative CLI, KN, and do service create. I define a name, web service, and then I need to specify uh, the image. It's on GitHub container registry, yes, slash spring.io slash web service. And that's it. So it looks like uh, a Docker experience here from a developer point of view. I'm just specifying an image. I allow the connection. And now Knative does all the rest under the hood. So under the hood, uh, we still have deployments, bots, replica sets, ingresses, all the standard Kubernetes resources. But now it's not me dealing with that, it's Knative. And you can see that I get a URL back that I can call. So I can send an HTTP request to that URL that's in the public cloud, and I call my application. So as a developer, really, I, I didn't even have to think about Kubernetes. I just provide a container image and it's deployed. But the container image, again, I don't want to uh, write a Docker file and spend too much time creating that. And I can do that with build packs instead. Build packs, there are different ways to interact with build packs. One way is using the uh, pack CLI. I can specify builder image and containerize the application here. But uh, you probably uh, know about the integration of build packs within Spring Boot. And make it bigger, yeah. Yes, we can yeah. do it from here. So for example, using Gradle, 
I can call the boot build image task and under the hood it will use build packs and produce a container image. In Maven uh, it's, there's a similar command. Mm -hmm. So it's very convenient with the pack CLI but with Spring Boot it's even more convenient because I don't have to install anything extra. It's just there with uh, the Gradle or Maven plugin for Spring. So what we achieve at this point is uh, this kind of experience. We have a project and by the way this is a polyglot uh, strategy. So we are using Spring Boot, but we could do the same with Go, with .NET, with uh, any other language or framework. Mm -hmm. We use uh, build packs directly via the pack CLI or in Spring Boot we have this convenient uh, integration within the Gradle and Maven plugins. We get a container image. Mm -hmm. With Knative we uh, use the Knative CLI to do the deployment and finally we get the image deployed in Kubernetes and we get the URL back which is really, really convenient. And if you're, ask, if you're wondering what is happening under the hood, so what is the KN CLI doing, I can show you the result, this developer-friendly abstraction that I mentioned earlier. It's a few lines of YAML code, which basically contains the same information I defined in the CLI. I have the image, I have the container port, and that's it. And this is a Knative service. It's called a uh, service, so don't, don't confuse it with the Kubernetes service, so they're called the same, but uh, this is a different resource. And it's the abstraction that as a developer I'm interested in. I don't want to know about ingress, deployments, and all the lower level abstractions. Mm -hmm. Yes? So we can use this strategy for any kind of containerized workload, for any kind of application. But since we are using Knative now and we are building this serverless experience, we can also start talking about functions, right? Let's do it. Yeah. So when we start talking about functions, then we are basically changing a little bit the paradigm, right? Like Thomas just showed that you can start with a container and then just deploy it to Knative and that will work. And by the way, when you deploy things to Knative, by default, it will try to auto scale that to zero if nobody's using it. But you can change that. That's not the, the only behavior that you have. You can have like a minimum set of replicas all the time. You can also create like a maximum set of replicas. So your application knows that it can scale, but also you know, up to a certain point, not until it blows up. Uh, but when you are dealing with functions, you are dealing with a different programming model, right? And what we wanted to show you here is how you can use Knative and something that we are building now in the Knative community that it's called Knative Functions. Just to be able to build this kind of like entire experience, not only on the Kubernetes cluster side, but also on the developer side as well. So with that, let me show you uh, like a quick demo about like what we are doing in Knative Functions. And what I wanted to show you here is that building on what Thomas just showed, we can create a function uh, using the func CLI, which is another CLI that we are building there. Uh, and I will just create a directory here that it's called func, spring IO func, because it doesn't exist, right? That's yeah. true. Yeah. First, create, then CD, right? Uh, func. Okay, so let's create a function. I can create a function. Uh, and then what I can do is I can do func create. So this is the new CLI that I was mentioning that we are building in the Knative community. And what you do is basically you choose the language that you want to use. Again, we are using build packs internally here just to be able to create functions in any language we want. I can use Spring Boot, I can use Go, uh, and I can choose uh, between a different number of kind of like templates. In this case, I'm using like an HTTP template. So basically, I'm building a function that is going to be using HTTP uh, in order to in just to interact. Like if I want to call the function, I will just send an HTTP request. So, and then the next thing that I can do is I can do func deploy. Again, I just scaffolded the project with the function in it. We will take a look in, uh, into that in a bit, but I will just hit deploy here. So uh, we uh, start building the function and uh, deploying it into a cluster. This is github container registry.io. I need to use Thomas. That's it? Yes. There you go. So basically what it, this is going to do is it's going to build the project that I've just created, but let's take a look into the project now. Um, and I just want to show here that it's just a simple, let's open this into idea. It's just a simple, you know, function in Java. Uh, and that was basically created by this func CLI based on a template that we have in there. So with func in this case, we can go from we can go from just creating the project to building the project and deploying the, uh, the project here into my Knative cluster. 
Uh, that's also using build packs. Again, we can build these functions in any language. I can create like a Go function using the same command, basically fun create, just choosing a different language and even choosing different templates, right? And in this case, we have a simple, you know, Java function. We're using Spring Cloud functions that Thomas is going to go deeper into that in a bit. Uh, that it's basically uh, doing an uppercase in this case of the string that, that we will send, right? So what I'm expecting after like the deploy finishes is to be able to have this function deployed in my Knative cluster, automatically being scaled up and down up to zero. Uh, and I should be able to also have a URL to interact with that function at the end of the of the process, right? So let me go back to the terminal here. We should be able to see that this is building something uh, because it's using Maven and it's also building, I think it's building a native image. It might be building a native image. It might take some time to finish, but the main idea here that we wanted to share is that you can just create a function pretty quickly, uh, allowing, allowing your developers to get started with that pretty fast. And then when you're not building kind of like hello world functions like this one that is just doing an uppercase, this is kind of like where you're going to put your function logic. Remember, when we are building functions, we are changing a little bit the way that we uh, design our solutions. And you are building things that are a little bit more, um, you know, more autonomous, more smaller, basically. They are just not fully fledged REST services. They are just more simple in nature. Usually functions are triggered by requests of events or events, right? Like we can have functions that basically react to events that are happening in the infrastructure. And again, as developers, we actually don't care who is calling our function. We only care about the business logic that we have in that function and the service that we need to interact with in order to do that logic. They, are, they tend to be very stateless and that's also related with the fact that the platform is going to be managing them when they are being scaled up and down. You need to think when you're building, when you're coding functions that you shouldn't be keeping a state in there because again, the platform will just probably shut the function down and the state will be lost. So usually you will use like an external storage. Uh, functions are smaller. That basically means also that they are easy to test because you can actually write the unit test for it. And you will not end up like building a lot of integration tests with functions unless you have a bunch of functions together that you want to test and uh, verify the behavior there. You will see that when you start looking and reading about for like function based or functional programming in, in, the, in the context of multiple functions working together as a distributed system, cold start is a big part uh, for the, it's a big thing that the platform needs to take care of. The idea here is that when you build functions, you need to make sure that the functions can start pretty fast, right? Because the platform will be upscaling, will be, you know, creating new instances of the function. And the idea is that the one that is sending the request shouldn't be waiting too much for the function to get started and then just get the response back. And of course, cost optimization, something that Thomas already mentioned, right? Like the fact that we can scale down to zero and scale up whenever we, we have demand, it's pretty important. When you think about functions, again, there are like a bunch of different patterns on how you interact with functions. And based on that, it's kind of like the tools that you will be using in order to implement the function logic and the tools that you will be using to wire function together, right? So you have on the synchronous, on the synchronous side of things, uh, like the idea that you can have a function that will perform an operation, but you are not interested in the response, right? Or maybe you will be calling a function and you are interested in the things that the function is calculating. So you will need to wait the function to finish the calculation to get the response back. And sometimes you need the function to go and read from an external storage, for example, the database, read some data, do some calculations, then write some data and then get the response back. And at that point is like when you start thinking about like latency and how, you know, how much the requester of the function will need to wait in order to get back the results. And when that becomes a problem, switching a little bit more to asynchronous uh, mode, it makes a lot of sense. So building asynchronous functions, it, it is a whole thing, and it's a thing that you need to have in mind when you are like analyzing the frameworks that you're using to build these functions. Uh, and, and that takes you also to like event-driven functions. The idea that, again, you have a function that is receiving an event and probably emitting an event out, and that takes you to these scenarios where like functions can be reacting to events that are happening in the platform that can be created by different things. Like, you know, you can be reacting, a function can be reacting to an event that it's coming from Slack. But when you design the function, you don't actually know who is going to be calling that. And you ended up like chaining these different, you know, functions together by just making sure that you expose to the platform which events the functions is consuming and which events the, the function is basically emitting when it's finishing. Uh, the Knative functions project, it's pretty, it's pretty new. It allows you to create functions based on different templates that can be also located into your own repositories. So the idea of starting with a function from scratch, 
can be you know, extended a bit further. So if you have a specific scenarios with very specific dependencies for your functions, you can create your own, your own repository templates. It does work with multiple languages and frameworks. You can check all the list of languages. It's pretty much everything that you can think of, and you can add your own as well. Uh, something that I didn't show here, I did like func create to scaffold the project and then func deploy. Func deploy is basically building and containerizing the function using build packs, but you can also run the function locally if you want to play with it uh, instead of just deploying it to a Kubernetes cluster. And we have something else there like in the community that it's called on cluster build, where the idea is that you as a developer building in your laptop, you don't even need to have Docker installed in order to work with functions. You can just code in your language of choice using Java or Go or whatever. And then when you do deploy the same command that I executed, it will just build the function in the, in the remote cluster instead of building it locally. That allows like, some scenarios that we face like, quite often that you know, people have very restricted you know, capabilities in their laptops. And having no Docker is, is one of those. And we are actively working on the 1.ga version for this project. So if you want to contribute, this is the perfect time. right? I know that I have a bunch of Spring folks here. And uh, we have all the Spring templates. And there are a bunch of other things that we can be doing there. So if you want to contribute to an open source project that is you know, a polyglot <coughs> project, feel free to reach out, because I'm, I'm really interested in, in helping people to get started with that process. Before I jump to that, let's see if the function actually got deployed. Probably not. Don't know what's happening. It's just there. Yeah. So connection or something. Probably. Yeah. But believe me, at the end of the process, you will get the function deployed. We will show more advanced functions when we play the game. So if the game works, <laughs> that's the other thing, right? So just a quick recap like, of what we have been seeing here is we used like a common uh, fun create to create a project, in this case, using a Spring Boot. Uh, we did func deploy, which is going to use build packs to create a container image and to deploy it to Knative in this case. To, and then we will have like the function running in there as a container, right? And again, we show the most basic example here where we have a single function into a container here. So we have a one function in a container, but we can have more. And then at the end of the process, we should get it back a URL. We can check that later if yes. that's the case, right? But now Thomas is going to show a little yes. bit more about the spring side of things. Why is that stuck there? That's a good question. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so let's talk about more uh, how to implement functions in uh, Spring. So how many of you have used Spring Cloud function before? Cool, some cool. people. Nice. Yes, so we're going to look into that now. Uh, and uh, uh, the first problem we need to solve the, is the cold start problem. That is mm -hmm. one of the features that we need in a f uh, function because we have this uh, scaling to zero capability. When a request arrives, a container needs to be up and running in uh, almost instantaneously. And uh, you have probably already heard about this uh, in some previous talks, both today and yesterday. But Spring Native provides a solution for that in uh, Spring Boot 2.x. And then it will be fully uh, part of the Spring Core framework since uh, the next major version. But with Spring Native, we can uh, uh, compile our Spring Boot applications as native executables using RHEL-DM. So we get very interesting uh, features for a serverless scenario. We get instant, uh, almost insta instant startup time. That's really important because uh, if there's no uh, containers uh, running and then a request arrives, we don't want the user to wait a few seconds before getting a response back. We also want to have instant peak performance. So once the application is up, you should uh, be able to uh, reply uh, with very high performance right away without waiting for some warm-up uh, step at the beginning. And also, we get some reduced memory consumption. We also like this because uh, with auto-scaling, it's very easy to uh, consume a lot of resources in case we have a lot of users and clients concurrently. Mm -hmm. So it's important to try to reduce also uh, the memory footprint of our applications. Of course, there's no silver bullet. Uh, we have some trade-offs here. So we get these benefits, but we also get a slower and heavier build process. I, uh, the GraalVM compiler is getting better and better with new versions, but still it takes more. Instead of waiting a couple of seconds for the application to compile, maybe you have to wait a minute or two. And that's why we, when using uh, GraalVM, we usually let the uh, CI pipeline deal with that. So locally we work with on the JVM, and then the pipeline takes care of building the native image. And the other thing is that there are fewer runtime optimizations because RHEL VM, what it does is that it moves uh, 
a lot of the things that uh, the JVM does at runtime, it moves them at build time. And making decisions at build time is uh, more restricted because you don't have all the information that you have in runtime about how the application is executing and what code uh, is called. So for that reason, there are these few runtime optimizations. Again, RHEL-VM is catching up quickly. It's uh, getting better and better with new versions, but still it's something to consider for uh, certain types of applications. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem solved. Then we need to consider how we work with the functions. So how we uh, use this uh, different paradigm while implementing our business logic. And we can do that using uh, very uh, standard uh, interfaces provided by the Java language, already from Java 8. We have these interfaces, supplier, functions, and consumer, and we can use them to implement our business logic in terms of these three interfaces, where uh, what it matters is the signature, inputs and outputs, and then inside the function we could use whatever we want. So the framework doesn't care. And speaking of framework, we have Spring Cloud function that can uh, automatically wrap those standard Java functions and add a lot of nice functionalities on top of that. For example, we get transparent type conversion. When you compose multiple functions together, then uh, the framework takes, <coughs> takes care of uh, the type conversion. If the first function output has a different type than uh, the second function input, we, we can't do that in standard Java. But with Spring Cloud function, then the framework takes care of that. Again, we can compose functions. As I said, that's really convenient. We can uh, uh, use multiple inputs and multiple outputs. We can even import, uh, import functions as uh, jar files. So we can have uh, a library of Java functions that then we can uh, embed in our application. As a matter of fact, uh, the Spring project has uh, several uh, out-of-the-box functions, uh, both uh, for uh, HTTP, but yeah. also to integrate with Spring Cloud Stream. And uh, there's really uh, a variety of functions that you can use to integrate with different uh, uh, databases, message brokers, and other external systems. And then it has reactive support. As a matter of fact, we can even combine imperative and reactive functions together, compose them together, and the framework takes care of uh, converting the types between the functions. So let's do a demo now. So you saw how to bootstrap a project using the func CLI. Mm -hmm. uh, now we'll use uh, a different way. We go to start.spring.io. And from here, I'll create a new Gradle project, uh, Spring Boot 2.7, Java 17. And the only uh, dependency I need is Spring Cloud function. I have already opened the project in my IDE. So yeah, that's there it is. No, that's mine. No, that's yours. That's yes. That's the we have a web function project. So you can see it's a standard Spring Boot application with a logger. We'll use it to uh, control what is happening under the hood. So at this point, let me get more space there. At this point, I want to implement the following business logic. I want to provide uh, as input the name of a musical instrument. I play the piano, so piano. Then I want to convert the instrument to uppercase. And finally, I want to build a sentence like, I play the piano. And I will implement this business logic using two functions. The first function will take care of converting the instrument to uppercase, the second function to build the sentence. And just because I can, the first function will be imperative and the second reactive. So let's start. I'm using a standard Java interface for defining the functions. We have input and output that are strings. Uppercase. Let's import the function there. Yes. And then we have the instrument as input. For the outputs, first I want to log a message, converting to uppercase. And then we return the same string, convert it to uppercase. That's my first function. Then the second part of the business logic is another function. This time I want to make it reactive. So I'll use a mono of string. A mono is a reactive uh, uh, type, which means at most one value. So you can compare it probably with an optional. So we have two, uh, two 
interfaces, two APIs in Reactive Spring. We have Mono and Flux. Mono is for at most one value, and Flux is for uh, a collection of values that will arrive eventually if and when available, because it's all asynchronous. So I'll have Mono of string in input and Mono of string in output. And this is to build a sentence. So we get this uh, mono object as input. And what I'm going to do here is to map the instrument that we get. And first, I want to log a message once again, building sentence with and the instrument. And then I return, uh, I play the space and the instrument. There you go. Yes, so, so far, standard Java, we have two functions. Now, in order to uh, trigger all the nice uh, features provided by Spring Cloud function, the only thing I need to do here is uh, uh, mark them as beans. And from this uh, point, Spring Cloud function will manage these functions, will enhance them with a lot of additional features. And if you have uh, a Spring Web dependency in your project, in my case, I have added Spring Web Flux. For each function, I also get an HTTP endpoint exposing that functionality. And then, on top of that, I can uh, decide how to compose them. So the, the Cloud function that I want to expose will be a combination of these two. I don't want to manage them uh, independently. So I'll go in the application property file and define the function that I want uh, the framework to uh, enhance. So I can say uppercase pipe sentence. So execute uppercase and then sentence. And this function will be automatically exposed via the root endpoint of my application. So let's run it. Uh, web function, yes. There you go. And of course, since uh, we are working with serverless, we can use Spring Native to make it a native image. Now that we have it, so let's do it here that is bigger. Yeah, I think that that's chair can that's yeah, I block with there. some timeout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but so now I can, uh, I'll use HTTP. I send the request to AD80, root endpoint. That's where my function is exposed by the framework. And I need to specify uh, the name of a musical instrument. So I'll uh, pass piano here and pipe. And then I get the response back. I play the piano. Good. So this is very interesting because I really focused on the business logic. And then the framework took care of doing the type conversion, function composition, also uh, mixing up together imperative and reactive, and also exposing the function via HTTP. But it can do much more than that. because uh, So this is just uh, a summary of what we did. This data processing, we can compose together a lot of different functions. But the interesting part is that once we have the business logic as standard functions, then we can uh, uh, expose them or deploy them in different platforms and using different strategies without changing our code, but just relying on the Spring Cloud function framework. So for example, we can have uh, some adapters that are available in the Spring Cloud function project and deploy those functions on Azure functions, AWS Lambda, and Google Cloud function. Or perhaps, and is yeah. what we are doing today, uh, we can just containerize in a standard way the function with build packs and deploy it on uh, Knative, on Kubernetes. B and we can even uh, uh, trigger the, the functions, not just via HTTP, mm -hmm. but perhaps using some event-driven strategies. We'll see very soon about cloud events, how we can uh, use cloud events in order to trigger and consume our functions. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even have to be HTTP. For example, RSocket, it's a reactive binary protocol, can be used to deliver uh, and trigger uh, these functions. And we'll see that later too, because we are using also RSocket in mm -hmm. our architecture. Yep, yes. sounds good. Uh, yep, do you want yes. to do the events part? 
Uh, yeah. Yes, just a quick uh, overview of cloud events, mm -hmm. and then we'll see some the some code about that. Because, Perfect. of course, we're talking about serverless. We talked about functions, synchronous functions. We used HTTP, mm -hmm. but of course, serverless is usually associated with event-driven architectures, and Knative supports that. We are, have already seen that because it's request-driven and event-driven. Mm -hmm. But the first problem, considering the cloud and considering the polyglot experience that we want to have so supporting different languages and frameworks, we need a standard way of exchanging and transferring these events across our infrastructure, considering that we're going to have different technologies uh, and different languages in place. Mm -hmm. And one standard way of doing that is via cloud events. So a cloud event is uh, it's a data format. It's not a protocol. It's just a data format defines some metadata. We have some ID, source, and type information that we use to route events. And then the payload, the data itself, can be whatever we want. It can be uh, a JSON object. You can even wrap AMQP messages or Kafka in order to achieve this uh, uh, standard way of exchanging data. And there, perhaps, some part of your system is using RabbitMQ. Some part of the system is, is using Kafka. And at that point, we also need a solution uh, in order to make those subsystems interact. And we'll see that in a bit but yeah. first let's uh, dive deeper into cloud events Le let's take a look let's take a look at that like something that thomas just showed is that he created a function using spring cloud functions right and the thing that i wanted to show here is that uh, we can take that uh, a step further into uh, using another func oh it's not there all right so yes. I switch yeah so if i switch to routing i guess i think that we can do it here right like oh okay so I think that the, the thing that I wanted to show here is that even if we have, oh, not there, here, let's do it here. So even if we have like a function that you can call by using, you know, just the standard like HTTP request, what you can do now is also something that the Spring Cloud function is providing is you can send a, a, a cloud event here. And I think that you can do that by just adding the C type, right? Yeah, C type, colon, colon and that's, uh, what's the name? Yeah, nothing here, yeah, so, uh, Blue sentence. I think let's try that. Uh, yeah, an ID, C ID. In general, what we talk when we talk about cloud events, we talk about this generic format that you can use in different languages uh, to um, just to share data about events. And basically, what we are trying to show here is that we can encode this request as a cloud event to interact with the function. And in the same way that we are doing it with HTTP here, we can be doing it with the RabbitMQ message or even with the Kafka message or with the cloud provider specific message. Kind of format. Yeah, in the case of HTTP, we use HTTP headers to yep. provide the metadata of the cloud event and the request body to pass the payload of the event. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So when I send this, right, like when I send this cloud event, what I'm getting back from it, it's another cloud event as a response. That basically means that now we are just sharing kind of like an instructor, a structure that can be picked up by something that understands about events and then just uh, route those events to the next function that is consuming this output. Uh, just to move things forward, right, like what I have here is I have uh, the same functions that, you know, uh, that Thomas defined, like this, the uppercase function and the sentence function. But what I did is I created, like, I added some other things in here. Where is it? Yeah, the branch. Here. Yeah, this is routing. So let me show, uh, let me switch to uh, the uh, force. force checkout. Let's do that. And basically what I have here is just a simple configuration. So instead of piping the functions as Thomas did before, what I just changed that I'm going to use a function router here, and I'm going to use the type of the event in order to route to different functions. So now I have a single project, a Spring Cloud Function Projects with two functions in there. And what I want to do is I want to send different cloud event types, and the different types will be routed to the different functions. And again, this will allow me to create like more complex compositions where we can have multiple functions defined in the same container. There is no need for having a function per container. You can have multiple functions per container and then use the function router in order to route different cloud events to different functions. So if I stop the application, yeah, yes. Uh, so basically what we can do is we can send this kind of like different types in this case. So I can send you know a cloud event with uppercase type in this case. That's the type of the cloud event. And then Spring Cloud Functions will understand how to route this cloud event to a specific function. And the same with the second one, that it's sentence. This is going to route that specific cloud event to the second function that it's defining there. And we can show that if we stop the application. Can you stop yes. it and run it again? Yes, thank you. It's not my laptop, sorry. Like, 
and he has a Danish keyword, so it makes it really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I that's mean, we're talking about polyglot experience. It's so a we're polyglot really experience. Different that's it. Right. Let's do it. There you go. So it should be running now, right? And again, that's it. that's the only thing that it's it's doing is just I'm just sending a cloud event there, and I'm getting a cloud event back. And as you can see, I'm getting a cloud event back in this case based on the type that the function is returning. This is a Java lang string. And you can use some other features in a Spring Cloud Functions just to deal with cloud events. So for example, if you want to go, if you know that you are building functions that are going to be reacting on events, what you can do is you can change the signature here of the functions to receive cloud events. And that's pretty much it, right? Like if you add the cloud events SDK, you can just do something like that. And then you know that the response will be a cloud event that you can decorate, you can define the type, and you can define kind of like all the properties that that cloud event will have. Again, making it easy to the platform to understand and route these events when, when the platform is getting and routing these to different functions that can, be, that can be running in different containers, right? Because remember, if you are building functions, the main thing that you want to achieve is you want to make sure that you can update each of these functions independently. If you have a bunch of functions in the same project, well, you have like that single unit of deployment that you will need to update every time that you do make a change. But if you have like functions in separate containers, then you can update them independently without the need of changing all the other functions at the same time. So the only thing that we wanted to show here is that kind of like extra capability of Spring Cloud Functions to route based on cloud events. And that native support for cloud events is becoming more and more important the larger the application that, that you want to build the moment that you go into that event-based kind of yeah. functions. So let's go back to the slides. Yeah, let's go back uh, on yeah the developer point of view. So we introduce mm -hmm. cloud events, but then as a developer, I don't want to deal with routing, I don't want to deal with uh, the infrastructure to exchanging events. And once again, Knative can help us with that. There's a, a separate project, so we talked about Knative serving. There's another project called uh, Knative Eventing, for routing and triggering functions based on events all uh, around the cloud event specification for the data format. So once again, developer-friendly abstraction. We really focus on reducing the complexity for developers. We get uh, the possibility to uh, establish these event-driven architectures. So we have serverless and event-driven. So we can build functions, synchronous and asynchronous. Event routing, that's uh, handled by uh, the project itself. We have po this polyglot support with cloud events. So we have this uh, agreed upon standard that mm -hmm. we can use in different languages and frameworks. It's pluggable. So as I said earlier, per perhaps in your system, some part of your system is using RabbitMQ, some part is using Kafka. The, you can plug both of them in Knative eventing. And then the, uh, from the developer point of view, you just exchange cloud events. But then uh, under the hood, there is a RabbitMQ instance that does uh, the work or Kafka, or you can even get events from Twitter. Maybe you're uh, listening to some Twitter hashtag or uh, a Slack, mm -hmm. getting notifications from Slack as cloud events and then route them throughout your architecture. By the way, GitHub just emit cloud events nowadays. So if you hook to GitHub kind of like webhooks, you can just get cloud events out of the box and then route those things into your systems. And yeah, once again, it's cloud agnostic. This is uh, build on top of Kubernetes. So on any Kubernetes distribution, you can install it. So at this point in the cluster, we have some extra uh, entities. We have a broker, which is an abstraction provided by Knative Eventing. The event sources, so you can have RabbitMQ there, Kafka, you can have Twitter. And then the triggers are those that uh, uh, route events to the functions mm -hmm. using cloud events. And then all our experience as developers is the same. We have uh, the func CLI we can use also to define a trigger. We deploy and we get a URL back. Perfect. So yep. let's go so back to the game now. Let's talk a little bit about the game yes. architecture. We have like few minutes left, so we will need to go fast. We built this uh, game in order to show this idea of having like different functions do doing different things. And the game is basically built with this like start game. So every time that you want to start playing, you will just call a function that will create like a session for your user. And then each question is implemented in a different function that basically evaluates the inputs that you are sending, right? Like the, the, you know, the answers that you are selecting. All that is going to Redis in a synchronous fashion. So basically, the game front end has all the logic to define which function to call next based on the level that you are. 
and then the game front end will need to wait for the function to go and store data into Redis in order to get the score back and send that back to the user. So it's a synchronous interaction, and you will see the more operations that you want to do here, the more time that it will take to go the, the whole way, right? And to get the data, the more like, you know, you need to wait, and depending on the logic, sometimes that's not feasible. It's important to notice here that the idea of dealing, kind of like of using Knative as a platform to run these kind of applications is that when nobody's playing level one or level five or whatever, there are no containers running in there because there is no need for a container to be running to for that level specifically. When people start playing, Knative is going to start scaling up that, and if there is a lot of demand, Knative will create more replicas to deal with, with that demand, basically, on based on requests. And it's important to understand that there is kind of like that orchestrator there that will contain the business logic on how to, uh, you know, connect to different level functions depending on, on the level that you are playing with. And we have a React application on the client side that basically means that, again, we will need to be able to expose a single entry point here. We are using kind of like that game orchestrator as a single entry point for the client side code to hit, you know, the backend and then the backend will redistribute to the different functions. This is all running in Google Cloud. It's running in a live cluster there, and we will, play, we will be playing against that environment. But again, as I mentioned before, this is all synchronous interactions, and that had a lot of limits, right? So you can enhance kind of like this architecture by using events, and using cloud events, and using Knative eventing, right? What we are doing in the levels now is that every time we have a flag there, that basically if we turn it on, it will emit like the score into the broker. So it will calculate the score for that level, and then it will emit that cloud event to the broker. And it will actually not wait for writing that in Redis, it will be emit just the cloud event. And this allows us to route the cloud event to different components. We can just send it to, for example, like an audit trail or other functions that are doing other calculations. But what we are doing here is we are sending it back to the front end, so then we can send it back to the client side. So we can start building these more reactive applications that have more interaction with the end user, and we will be seeing how can like this uh, translate into notifications basically every time that you complete a level in the application. Yes. So I think that it's time let's just have some fun. Let's have some fun and let's 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 play. Should we change the URL first? So before showing that, let's uh, let's apply the change. Oh yes. Yeah. We need to do something first. And this is this apologize because we have been building kind of like a game specifically for you, but we were hitting some netty issues this morning. And I wonder why. Yeah. Uh, we will need to troubleshoot that later so you will be playing, you know, a version of the game. It's not the final one, and we will keep improving that uh, the more we play. So if you scan that, you can start playing. Hopefully, it works. If it blows up, that's also. <laughs> it is not working, so we have people saying that it's, it's not working. working. Yeah, so. Can you try again? And we, what we play, we will have Thomas, you know, playing the keyboards. Let's see how that. There you go. Is it working? No? So we have one person saying that it's not. Tinyurl.com spring funk spring iOS dash funk. Is it working? No? Well this is how you crash live. And when we show this, I could say that the URL is correct. Go here. Not working. So some some people manage to work. We can see people playing there. It doesn't show the Twitter thing. If you don't have Twitter, that's fine. You don't really need to tweet. But yeah, the, the main idea there is to play all together. Yeah, people we are have playing. 100 people playing there, so that's kind of like cool. Thank you very much for participating. And yeah, look at that. Those are all the events popping up. <laughs> you see that JavaScript blowing up. I think that one of the things that blocked our demo is like the, the fact that the, the keyboard, like the garage band, is open. And it might be delaying a bit, kind of like the compilation. As you can see. So, look at that, it's crashing like crazy. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So, folks, thank you very much for playing with us. Yes.
That's 